friends, this is David Vos. Today is April the 21st, 2015, and it's great to see everybody today. Well, this is going to be full and packed, full of information and things and thoughts and concepts that you probably have never heard before in your life. Now, I've been trying to introduce some of these truths into my videos slowly because if I put a bunch of these thoughts into one video, people are going to tune off, click it, see you next time. But I don't want you to do that because I want you to be able to learn. And if I just tell you th something, you know, just out of the blue, without a lot of foundational truth behind it, you know, now I think I've covered very clearly in some of my past videos of how the God of the Old Testament is not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That this was a teaching of the early church, which, you know, and I'm not real stuck on the idea that the early church was called Gnostic. I think that's the the word that we've pinned on them and, and not necessarily correctly. I'm not opposed to the word Gnostic at all. It just means those who seek knowledge or whatever, who, who believe in knowledge. Um, I don't like knowledge, but this is a different kind of knowledge. And that's a whole nother issue here. But we get our concept of Gnostics from some teachers that lived maybe two, three hundred years after Christ. And that's not any, it's, I believe they may have had more truth than the Catholic apostasy that stifled them, burned all the books, and, and took, took out the Alexandrian library, and a lot of things like that. But they were not inspired of God. They were simply groups of people that had come down, have gone through all this apostasy, and were trying to find the truth. Um, human beings... Are imperfect and so the knowledge that we get out of these groups hundreds of years after Christ even if they were Gnostic doesn't mean that they knew everything some of them got into some very odd things there have been some false teachings out of that movement as well the idea that the physical world is only evil is a false teaching but it's very close to the truth because it is the physical world is temporary and we should have control over it like someone who rides a beast and puts a bit in its mouth, we're able to control it. The, fa the, the thing of it is, is that at this point in time, the flesh has taken over the spirit. And this is now a uh, uh, carnivorous, ferocious, wild, carnal nature, this fallen nature that is ruling over us. But in the mysteries, in the real and true ancient knowledge the body the physical world was very precious and one of the sayings is that eternal joy cannot exist without the physical and the spiritual being inseparably joined these are two parts of the creation that are both good and there isn't anything evil about the creation the only thing is is that we humans have our own creation. That's what people are calling the matrix. I mean, that's just a movie that's come out recently, but it's a very good way to explain the human mind that creates the physical world in a very distorted view. Our mind is not the mind of the Lord. The earth at this present time is not doing the will of the Father. And so there is an eternal mind of the Lord and in a physical world that is perfect and pure, if there's a physical, there's also a spiritual body. And that spiritual body, it's the same body that the Lord Jesus Christ was resurrected with. And he said, touch me and feel. I'm not a, just a spirit, but I have flesh and bones. The interesting thing, and I've, I've told people this before in some of my other videos, is that when he said that, he never used the word blood. And that's the only place in the Bible that that term flesh and bones is used because there wasn't any bodies that were just flesh and bones up until that time. That was the resurrection of the Lord. And that's the kind of a, a body that we're going to 
have physical flesh and bones, but it's not going to have this, this old contaminated DNA, this old blood that has been, you know, it's this, it's got this matrix with all these demonic forces, the 12 zodiacal signs and all those principalities, powers, and dominions that are ruling over us in this astral world. This is the matrix that we live in. So what we're trying to do is reach the kingdom of heaven, which is his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for that, not for our distorted illusion, this world, this present evil, carnal, fallen world, but we are praying for the kingdom of God to be established upon the world, for the mountain of the Lord, the stability of his truth and reality to be set up. And that city, that new temple, that new house or the abode that he went to prepare for us, it's going to come down out of heaven and be married like a bride with her husband. And that's the, the wedding of the Lord. And there's the, all the parables in the Bible about this wedding. And all the parables about the harvest. And the harvest is the, the end of the world when all the souls are harvested. And there's a period of time when all the wheat and the weeds grow together. And at the period of time at the end where the, there's this big harvest. And it's the harvest of souls. And that's going to happen. And then there's going to be a judgment. So all of this is real. And all of this is true. But what I want to get into today is... There's, there's so many, there's, part of Christianity has lost a, a very important truth. We talked about it, how we've lost sight of who God is, first of all. And that is that we actually st still want to put ourselves under this old covenant. But this entire historical matrix that we've been put into, there were some evil people that have corrupted our teachings, have burned them all have taken our history from us and we don't know a lot of stuff that is now being revealed and coming out from the earth in these books. And we've got to go back and start understanding our real history. But it's very difficult to do that because as we begin to read the true history, we still can't get over. It's, it's amazing to me. There's so many people that just can't get over some of this false information that's been put into their mind. Everybody is in the, under the con concept that the Jewish people are the chosen people. And not only do they think that the Jews are a little group of people over there in Palestine, but they're under the impression that these Jews are somehow chosen and more intelligent, and, and they should rule over us, and 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 their God loves them, and, and and everything depends on them, and not us. And it's it's I don't know what people really think because why would Jesus come to the earth and be born in Palestine? And many people think, well, he was born as a Jew, and they must be something special. All the prophets came through them, and they. Moses and he wrote the law. Most people think that's a good thing. What they don't understand is that the law is what kept us in bondage. But hopefully I'm talking to a lot of people that have already been listening and they've already, you know, kind of established the fact and beginning to really understand that we've been lied to. Uh, some of you are, are just saying, this doesn't make any sense. This is God's chosen people. This was his law. Jesus came to fulfill it. So why is it wrong? covenant that the Jews had was valid. It doesn't mean that it didn't, you know, it's not like Jesus came to the world and, and looked at the Jews and their law and said, oh, this is stupid. You know, it was something to worry about. It was a valid covenant that the Jews made with some very powerful beings, principalities, powers, dominions, lordships, and thrones an entire administration of angels. We've talked about how this, this angelic group of beings is the astrological forces that rule over this physical world, the astral beings that we call demons at times. How do the demons have their authority? 
through the law. The, their, their master is the accuser. The accuser accuses the brethren day and night. How does he accuse us? I mean, why would why would God allow somebody to walk into his throne room and say, hey, we don't like these guys. We're going to accuse them day and night. God would say, get out of here. I don't want to listen to that, right? Well, the reason God doesn't do that is because they've got a point. They've got a valid contract. Now, there are parts of the Bible that is... Our entire history, it's, a, it's an amazing matrix because there is things you can learn on one level that, that really mean something in another level. So as human beings were bound under the law of Moses, which is, you know, and, and all human beings are bound under the same law. It isn't just Jews because Adam and Eve chose the tree of the knowledge of right and wrong or law. They chose this system. We all chose it. We're all under this. We're, our eyes were all opened and we became physical. We're physical beings trapped in listening to the serpent, which is the flesh. So all human beings are under the same. We're under law. And we're under the physical, carnal, wicked forces of this world. So on another, so in one sense, when Jesus came, he came to do away with the law of Moses. But in another sense, he came to do away with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the matrix, serpent, the serpent, everything, all this mess that we're involved in. And there's layers of it. The entire Jewish system is only, in a sense, a, a typical a type of what's happening in a greater sense. That's why Paul says that this Jerusalem represented our mother, which is in heaven. See, there's a spiritual part to this. There's a new Jerusalem coming out of heaven down, you know, and, and she's going to be married to, to Christ. And uh, it's, it's the marriage of the physical and the spiritual worlds. Now that you've gotten this going on in your head and you're saying, okay, this is really odd because here we're taught that the Jews are the chosen people. Turns out that they killed the Lord. Why did Jesus, if, there, if, if all that law is wrong and bad, and everything, why did Jesus come to the earth and become a Jew in the land of Palestine, born under the law, that he might redeem those that were under the law? Well, that is a mouthful. That is, th here's what we're going to pick apart today. Why was Jesus born a Jew? Or why are they the chosen people? What is it? They, are they really chosen? It's, it's, it's something that you, you probably can't even imagine that I'm about to tell you. But it's, 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 there's a whole bunch more to this. There's layers of this. And so the Jewish people then, after they left Egypt, they went through this 40 years of wandering in the desert. And then they went to the Jordan River, which is descent. That's what the word means. And they, were, they descended into the river. And I was talking to you about how that's the lowest point on the earth. So, you have to understand that all of this is symbolic of the fact that Jesus Christ had to descend into the lowest place in the universe to conquer all these principalities, powers, and dominions. And where would be the lowest place? Death. A place of suffering is a low place. But you, you just keep suffering until what? The end of it is death. And Jesus died on a cross. It was a great battle. And he conquered all of these forces. So why was he born in this spot with the Jordan River? Why was he baptized in the Jordan River? That's the lowest river on the face of the earth. Those physical forces and, and all that energy and everything that's flowing through there. His soul had to reach that lowest point. Take up that cross and die. Once he conquered all of those lower forces, he could start ascending. So why then are the Jewish people chosen? They brought us the physical laws. They are in the lowest place on earth. They're ruling over us with physical things and carnal things. They're not chosen the way that you believe. Judas was chosen. Judas is the, the way that they translate Judah there. 
It's the same word, Judah. Each one of the 12 uh, disciples that Jesus chose represented one of the 12 tribes. Judah or Judas represents the Jews. He betrayed the Lord. The other tribes are lost, friends. They went into exile. They're lost to the world. That's you and me. So who's really chosen? Jesus loved the other sheep very, very much. When he came to the earth, he had to go unto the lowest place and conquer all things. And it was that Jewish people that are destined, chosen to be the ones to betray the Lord, the Christ the child. And right now, it is these people who are betraying us. But remember, Jesus said, when he came to the earth, he came to seek out that which was lost, the ten tribes. And when he found the Jewish people there, he said, you are from your father, the devil, and you're the offspring of vipers. But he told his apostles to go forth and go and find the lost tribes of the house of Israel. And friends, that's where Peter was sent. That's why we don't have a lot of writings about Peter, because Peter right away took off and went to Babylon, to those eastern countries. And we don't know where he went after that, but he writes the his letters from Babylon, because that's where the lost tribes were last seen. They were seen captive into exile, into Syria and Babylon. So he went over there, as the one that, you know, Jesus said, I'm sending you forth. I want you to feed my sheep. You don't think Peter obeyed the Lord? He didn't go to the Jews. That wasn't his sheep. That was one flock. But Peter was supposed to go unto the lost tribes of the children of Israel. And that's where he went. He went to Babylon. Thomas went to India. And, and you know, they went all over the world to find the lost sheep. They're all over the world, friends. And yes, they're here in America before we even got here. The lost tribes are all of the world. And Jesus loved those. And he went to seek them and to find them and to gather them. And that's why the Bible talks about the great harvest at the end of the world and the gathering. You see, people are so, we're missing so much of the gospel because we've got words like church and we think, oh, it means a building with a cross on top. It's not what it means at all. The word church means it, gathering, the great ingathering of all the souls unto the Christ. It's nothing to do with a building. It has to do, the church is what Jesus was doing on the earth, gathering the children of God, all the 12 tribes back into one. But the Jewish people were definitely chosen, that they were chosen to live in the center of the earth, the lowest point, the Dead Sea, the lowest river of the earth, and those carnal energies, they are that serpent, the, the offspring of the serpent. They are that flesh that is ruling over the spiritual. They are the technological, always, you know, rebelling against the spirit and conniving and trying to build towers unto God in heaven that, from their own works, inventions and ideas. They're always seeking to get around, to get some money. You know, Judas betrayed the Lord for just a little bit of money because it was more important to him. And it's a representation of the Jewish people today. Really, it's a religion. It's not even really a, a race. It's a, it's a force. It's a thing that we've got to overcome that's in all of us. It's the flesh. And it's the flesh that's ruling over all of us. The, the mysteries then, as many of you know, were written down by Enoch. He's the one who walked with God. Now, a lot of you are familiar with the word phoenix. 
Okay, there's a phoenix bird. He was supposed to die. I mean, it's on the dollar bill and the eye and the Egyptian osiris and the, and the phoenix bird and all this stuff. Phoenix is the word for Enoch. Enoch walked with God, wrote all this stuff down, and it, and it was put into physical knowledge. And they were building these physical temples. And they were building this priesthood on this physical earth and trying to encode all of this in a matrix. The problem is, is these beings fell from heaven and they've screwed up this matrix so that we're all in this big web of lies and we've got to overcome it in order to get through. As Christians, we just think, well, it's very simple. There's the Jews, they're the chosen people, and we're not. And there's Palestine, and that's where the temple's going to be, and that's it. I mean, it's just that simple. We're Christians, but we're second to the Jews. We're waiting for their temple to be built, and they're the 144,000. We've got a special relationship with God. And as Christians, you know, we're going to in inherit everlasting life, but that's, that's good enough for us. But it's not the truth. They don't understand that the 12 tribes is everybody, and the Jews is just the one tribe, and they don't know why that one tribe was chosen and what they were chosen for. They don't understand the matrix here, that that little spot in Israel is that lowest vibration on earth that Jesus had to overcome, that we all have to overcome the flesh. And it, he died, was baptized into that water, went down deep to the bottom of that ocean to the, or that river and he made that descent, came up cleansed because you see, you overcome the flesh. We need to be baptized into those energies, those physical learning energies. And through the learning process, we come out clean. That's why he told, Jesus told the man to go bathe in the river Jordan for seven, seven times and then he would become, he wouldn't be blind anymore. Because blindness is a spiritual blindness that we all have. See, this whole story is a very spiritual story. Jesus came to open the eyes of the blind. We're the blind. He came to take the lame so they could walk. Well, it's the flesh that's blind. And it's the flesh that's lame. He came to help the Jews open their eyes. And he came to find that which was lost, which is the rest of the tribes of Israel. And Peter went to Babylon to find them. Thomas went to India. And there's records that when Jesus, before Jesus was 12 years old, where did he go? Well, he was in Egypt, learning all the ways of the Egyptians, just like Joseph before him, who was the high priest of On, of Heliopolis. And he wrote all those prophecies about Christ dying, conquering death who put those astrological things in our cultures all over the world. They're in every culture, Aztec, Mayan, Babylonian, Syrian, all the cultures of the world. You look up into the sky and you see the virgin there and you see the, the dragon, Draco, with his tail surrounding the Pleiades and, you know, trying to, to get to God's throne there in the north. That's, that's the direction that the earth follows. Go into Orion. And, and these stars are up there and they represent the story. There's the lamb. There's the bull, Taurus. There's the cherub that fell. The cherub is the four faces of the astrological signs of the zodiac. And these forces that rule over us, they rule over us from the physical body by means of the laws of Moses. And the flesh and the lowest forces on earth right there. And if you're going to come into the world and you're going to go to the lowest place on earth, the most ignorant, wicked, carnal laws that are on this earth that controls us all, you went down to the Jewish people there in Palestine and you went into that Jordan River and you dunked into it. And you were crucified right there on their hill. And then you could say you conquered it all. Because Judah is going to come and he's going to betray you. And we're all going to go through this. The flesh is going to betray you, but you're going to overcome it. And the flesh is going to betray you for a few pieces of silver. 
They're, they're seeking a material world, a physical world. They're not spiritual at all. But I want you to understand who really is, who has the mysteries. Was it really the Jewish people? They had some part of the mysteries. They had what? The law. But they didn't understand it. It was just a bunch of physical laws that kept them in bondage. They were blind. They were lame. But to get the mysteries, to get the truth, Jesus had to go down into Egypt. And he says, I'm going to call my son out of Egypt. He went down there and he began to learn the mysteries. And under those temples were that labyrinth where all those books and knowledge was. And the priesthood that brought down that knowledge that Enoch brought from the stars. Because Enoch went and he was taken with them, with the gods for many days. And, and, and this is in the book of Enoch. It's also in the Sumerian tablets, how he learned all of the truth and astrological charts and all the ways of the heavens and the 360 degrees. And he wrote all this stuff down. We don't have all this information. It's in the labyrinth. We only have the, the, the basic symbolic version that's in the book of Enoch that tells us just very, very, you know, one day we're going to open up the books and we're going to learn all this stuff. But Enoch walked with God, talked with God and learned all this information and put it down. It was encoded by some wicked forces on earth. It was taken over and they began to, to, to hide it from us in these four-sided pyramids in this three-dimensional matrix so that we couldn't find it. But it's there. And Jesus went down into Egypt to get it. Now remember Moses, he was in Egypt too, remember? And he learned all the ways of the Egyptians. But the problem with Moses is that when he tried to tell the people, they didn't want to hear it. They weren't ready for it. He saw God face to face. But when the people saw Moses, he was so bright, they couldn't look upon him. In other words, they couldn't, they didn't want to see the truth. It was too bright, too much. They wanted it to be veiled. So Moses said, all right, I'm going to veil it for you. So the Jewish people have what we call the veil. They're the ones who created the matrix. They put it down in this physical parable. Now it's wrapped up in a parable and we can't untangle it. The truth is in there, but it's congealed. It's spiritual truth congealed into a bunch of parables that you can't comprehend. That you're trying to figure out, well, what does this mean? What does that mean? You see, the only way we're going to know the truth is that by reading the scriptures, we finally realize that, hmm, I recognize Christ. You see, the, the disciples were walking along the way and they were eating bread. Now, the bread, the five loaves is the, is the law of Moses and they were eating it. And it says that, he, that this man that was with him that they didn't recognize after the resurrection, he began to explain to them, all that was written from, from the beginning of time to the end and how Christ was all what it was written about. And they began to realize Christ. In other words, all these, this matrix, they couldn't understand until they finally realized it was all about Christ. That this was just a parable, that this was keeping them down, that they were going through this flesh to learn. And then one day they were going to open their eyes and see Christ. So, Moses then had the truth, but he got it from Egypt. He got it from Joseph. Joseph got it from Enoch. Enoch wrote it down. But the world couldn't grasp everything that Enoch had written. It wasn't meant, we weren't meant to grasp it right away because human beings are growing and maturing and God's patient with this, and one day we're going to understand all this stuff. But God kept it preserved so that one day we could see that he's always had this information for us, but we didn't want it. So he would He would always offer it to mankind. He offered it to Adam and Eve, but they chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They, they chose the law, the matrix. He offered it to Israel. He said, look, I'm going to take you to a land of milk and honey and, and fruit and you know pomegranates and dates. And they said, no, we want the meat. We want the carnal death and murder. Don't speak to us, God. We want Moses to speak to us. We want the priesthood. We want a matrix. We want a veil. When they saw Moses, they saw it was something that was too bright. 
because he knew all the truth. He was down there in Egypt and he had all this truth that he he read, that he he spent time with angels and, and, and you know, he had the priesthood. The true priesthood, which is through Egypt, all the way back through what we nowadays call Atlantis, but which was that city that was before the flood, that was where Enoch learned all this these mysteries. And they had they build these huge pyramids in this huge city. And all we know of it now is a parable or a, a, a mythological place called Atlantis. But it was it's in the Bible, but it's called Enoch who walked with God. That's all we've got in the Bible of it. But it's 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 they talk more about it in the Sumerian tablets and the, the books of Enoch that were finally discovered here in the last few years. So you've got to go back and read that now. And even that's not going to give you all the information because mankind's still not ready for all this information. It's going to be coming out as we can absorb it. As we, if, if you're capable of seeing some of these clues, then you'll be able to, to know what's coming on later on. God will give you what you're ready for. Any of you out there really want to know all this truth, you need to go to God in prayer. Seek God with your complete, total, humble heart. But the only way that you're going to be able to, to, to see that light that the children of Israel rejected is if you're willing to let go of the matrix. The selfishness, the lust, the fear. And it's going to be a process. It's not going to be easy. You can't just say, God, would you just please tell me um, all these wonderful things that I'd like to know. Well, he will. But the problem is, as soon as he starts to tell you, that's not right. I don't want to believe that. Um, I'm too busy with my girlfriend and with, you know, and all this technical equipment and law and my work and this and that everything, and I don't have time. You see, so God's really kind of tied. His hands are tied because you're really not ready for this knowledge. Just like the Egyptians or the Israelites who wanted to go back to Egypt into this matrix of this three-dimensional world. Moses brought that knowledge out and he was shining bright. So, if Moses had all the truth right then and there, what do you need all this law for? Well, that was the veil. And it goes down deep, 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 deep. Because, you know, a lot of you think, well, he got this priesthood from God, right? No, 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 no. Remember the Israelites said, we don't want God. What we want is a priesthood. Who gave the priesthood? A lot of people don't know this, but it was a man called Jethro. <laughs> Sounds like a hillb Beverly Hillbillies, doesn't it? But his name was Jethro, and he's in the Bible. And he's the man that gave Moses the priesthood. See, Moses, he had all this knowledge. He was glowing, and the people were like, wow, this is too much for us. And Moses didn't know what to do. He says, I need to tell the people this truth. But they don't want to hear it. Well, Jethro says, listen, listen, Moses, forget it. These people are wearing you out. All right. So here's what you do. They've already asked for a priest to give it to them. So they began to make the elders, the priests, and, and, and they started this thing called the priesthood. And it really came from a man named Jethro, who had nothing to do with the children of Israel wasn't even one of the tribes of Israel. This, what this is, and, and, and this man came from the east, it says. That's all it says. It came from the east. We don't know where it came from. So we got our priesthood from some place. It's not even from God. It's from this world. And it was, it was true. A lot of you are saying, wait a minute, the, the law of God is true and holy and good. Paul says that. Yeah, he does. It was true and holy, but it's written as a veil to keep the truth, to preserve the truth. And it is holy because a child, as a baby, you need that little bottle, that little pacifier, because you need nourishment. You need your bottle. You need your food, but you're just a baby. And so you can't comprehend it all. So that's why you've got to have this veil because that light's blinding you. The light, friends, is powerful. The truth would blow your mind, but in order for you to hear it or see it, you've got to be willing to let go of this little matrix you've got. Remember Abraham when he came there and he 
He met Melchizedek. He brought bread and wine. Who's Melchizedek? See, there's a lot of people in the Bible that you're not being told. It says in the book of Hebrews that this Melchizedek was more important than Abraham. Who's Melchizedek? Meli Zadak. Zadak means righteousness. Meli means king. He was the king of righteousness. Who is this king of righteousness? This was the true priesthood with no veil. Just like Moses went down into Egypt and got this information, but he couldn't give it to the people and he had to put it into a, into a matrix, into this law, holy and true, but, but for children, for the weak. So Abraham met with the king of righteousness and learned all the ways of the truth and became the father of a multitude of all the other nations of the world. He's our father. He's our spiritual father. And today, Abram, you see, his name was Abram, which in Hebrew is Brahma, because you can spell it forwards or backwards. Brahma, Abram. And it just means the father of all. The ancient Abraham who brought that knowledge into India. But we don't see it. It's written under the surface. It's trying to tell you, okay, all this information that you're learning is just parables. If you want to know the truth, you got to see that little symbol in there that's guiding you over here. It's showing you, okay, the real priesthood of Melchizedek. was something that they didn't even have in the Jewish priesthood. It was a lower priesthood that veiled the truth because the children of Israel, all of us, all the 12 tribes were too little. We're just children of God and we had to learn. We weren't ready for it. Daniel went into Babylon. He became the head of the Magi, the astrological magicians. The Magi means magician. And they they were into astrology. And it was that star that guided him to Jesus. A lot of people think, oh, <clears throat> they saw a star and the star was moving. Like, you know, maybe it was a spaceship, right? No, it was astrology. By the astrological charts, they figured out where he would be born. And it pinpointed the place that it had been written in all the prophecies by Enoch, where this this Christ would be born. And he had to be born in, in this lowest place on earth and go through the lowest river on earth and be crucified there. They knew that. So Daniel was a very wise, great prophet. And he taught the Persians. Remember now, he was the high priest over the, the priesthood of Babylon and Persia and Media three of the great world powers in that area. And all of the astrological peoples, the Zoroastrians and Mithraism and all of these ancient religions came from Daniel and the high priesthood there. And they were the ones that taught them all the mysteries that came out of Joseph from, and then originally came from Enoch and that was being stored there in these libraries and with this priesthood. The Jewish people, they took this priesthood, they veiled it and made the law. And that law has kept us in bondage because it's blinded our minds. So friends, you know, I think I'm gonna stop there and I'll leave some some more information for another video. But um, I hope this helps some of you kind of get a little glimpse of the what we're dealing with here. And, um, who these Jewish people really are and who we, we really are. And so friends, I'm going to go ahead and sign out. This is David Vos. You guys have a great week.